conversation. So thanks to <laughs> Malefica Death of the Institute. And um, thank you, Dr. Santi, for, for your kind introduction. Um, I want to talk to you about a topic that has um, been increasingly on my mind. And this is the issue of black feminism and African feminism. Because I've heard an increasing number of, of sisters, um, some of them my students, and claiming that they are feminists. And I wish to say that at some point I myself called or considered myself a feminist uh, simply because I did not know, I didn't know better really. Um, and so what, what I want to do today is really engage this topic of black feminism and African feminism. So what are those? These are theories that were proposed to deal with gender issues in the United States. And this is where we have black feminism and on the African continent. And this is where we have, this is where we have African feminism. So these are theories and it's important to understand what a theory is. The theory is not something that falls from the sky, but a theory is created by people. And people, regardless of what people claim, uh, can never be objective, can never be neutral, uh, simply because we all carry with us a particular worldview, a particular social, you know, status, um, you know, our own personal experiences, traumas, you know, and then our own preferences, our own biases. So what we find in a theory is that whoever created that theory, I mean, all of that theorist, you know, baggage basically is in that theory. You know, so those people who are keen on conflict will produce conflict theories. People who have a materialistic worldview will produce materialistic theories. And people who are racist will produce racist theories. We know that all too well, you know. Um, and so, again, um, there's no neutral ground. We have to understand this. Uh, secondly, European theories have been used in the past and continue to be used against us. Um, as what I call major weapons of mental incarceration and westernization of our consciousness. We go to their schools, we go to their universities, we see their classes, and they push their theories on us. They demand that we, will, we learn them because, you know, it is implicitly stated that these are universal and objective theories that basically are valid for all people in the world. And the result for us who are subjected to theories produced by Europeans who have their own cultural, you know, outlook, their own worldview, their own biases, their own agenda, uh, their own racial agenda, um, then the outcome for us is dislocation. And dislocation from an African standpoint is, you know, seeing the world, including ourselves, which is the worst part, through the eyes of Europeans. And since those eyes are most of the time, if not all the time, degrading, then we start seeing ourselves in a very negative light. And so, interestingly enough, and not surprisingly, you know, when uh, African scholars and you know, these African, you know, Pan Africans, and stuff from the diaspora in the continent, when we, we, we are faced with Something happened to the audio. Yeah, briefly went off. I'm not hearing anything. Doctor, I'm mute. 
Yeah, okay, go right ahead. I, I, I am sorry about that. Let me just... Uh, Simultaneously corroborate and subjugate I'm to sorry. conceal deliberate marginalizing ideological maneuvers that define otherness. So, again, you have those different oppressions, racial, gender, right? Um, social that come together and create this complex oppression, this complex situation. Now, interestingly enough, um, although intersectionality was created by Black women, it became extremely appealing to a large number of scholars, white scholars, across a wide disciplinary spectrum. So we have you know, sociologists, economics, political scientists, psychologists, legal scholars, etc., are basically jumping on intersectionality and applying it to their work. And as a result of this, of course, what we have had is, you know, a situation where intersectionality has become really vague, ambiguous, and even inconsistent, you know, people using it in different ways. However, there is one thing that cannot be disputed about uh, intersectionality is that it has been heavily influenced by postmodernism. And postmodernism is, again, um, a European paradigm that has uh, basically engaged in uh, what uh, people call a deconstruction and radical doubt, basically questioning all those values, at least claiming to question all those values upon which European modernity was based, like rationalism, you know, um, and, and saying that, you know, things are more complex, that the world is in constant motion, so therefore nothing, we, we, we don't know anything anymore for sure, so there's no absolute truth, no absolute certainty. And that identity is itself fluid and ever-changing that who you are today is not who you were yesterday or even five minutes ago. But when we say I, we don't really know who, what you're saying. Who is I, right, for example? So you have this, this really very shaky, very fluctuating, very fluid and complex, supposedly an ever-changing situation where it becomes very difficult to talk about anything. You know, they would dispute the notions of gender. They say, what is gender? What is a woman? What is a man? What about race? What is race? Who is black? What does, what does blackness mean? What does whiteness mean? What does anything mean, you know, or class? What does it mean to be, say, that you're oppressed? Well, you're oppressed today, but later you were an oppressor, you know? Maybe you're a black woman who was oppressed at work. But when you came home, you oppressed your children or your dog. So that makes you an oppressor, you know? So everything became very, very, um, very shaky, really. Uh, they also question postmodernism, also questions heterosexuality, you know? And they start become, becoming critical of heteronormativity, claiming that this is all part of, you know, this, this uh, white male, you know, white modern male, you know, norm, you know, imposing, imposing his own heterosexuality on the rest of the world. And so now you have theories like gender theory, which says that it's not because you were born with a penis and testicles that you are necessarily a man. It's not because you're born with, you know, uh, a vagina that you're necessarily a woman. That really what matters is how you feel inside your gender. So there's a difference between your sex, which is biological, and your gender, which is internal, you know. So again, we are in this radical doubt, this construction. Um, and then there's, you know, an obsession with sexual orientation, you know, um, that, you know, now since, since we're not, you don't have to be heterosexual, you know, we can be anything we want. And, and so you can be, you know, in love with animals, with children, people with the same sex, you can be bisexual, transgender, asexual, if you want, you have no libido, you can engage in sologamy, meaning that you go and marry yourself, 
uh, childlessness may become, you know, your thing that you, know, you don't want children and you want to define yourself as someone who has chosen not to have children and you want everybody to know that you have made that choice. I mean, this is all sexual orientation. Uh, where, again, because everything has become um, up, you know, uh, open for, you know, basically uh, exploration, everything becomes possible. But this is postmodernism doing that. And intersectionality is a postmodern theory. Um, I'm citing here Hill Collins and Chep. Uh, this is what they have to say. Intersectionality's focus on relationality, multiplicity, complexity. So when you see those words, you already know where they're coming from. And social boundaries has helped to recast gender beyond narrow definitions of women. So what is a narrow definition of women? Number it's defining women in physiological terms. This is what a narrow definition of women is for them. And has shifted attention to the complex relational boundaries that construct our understandings of masculinity and femininity. All right, so here we go. And so the implications is that now we have this very blurry, if not shaky, sense of identity as African women, because we don't even know what a woman is anymore. And also because we are the site or we experience multiple oppressions at the same time, intersectionality also encourages us to uh, build alliances with other groups rather than with our own. It's not necessarily against building bridges with, you know, alliances within our group, but it's, uh, it favors, you know, building bridges and alliances with other groups. So let's say that, and here I quote Collins, Hill Collins again in chat, uh, where they say that these new conceptions of identities and communities can broaden our understanding of political allies and effective political partnerships rather than organizing the long single systems of power. For example, either gender or racial oppression, you know, like we see all black people press, let's get together. So instead of doing this, or instead of organizing uh, around single issues, for example, HIV, AIDS, activism, um, HIV AIDS activism or welfare reform or on behalf of a single community, for example, either gay activists or single mothers, intersectional approaches to coalition building enhance democratic possibilities by expanding definitions of political lives, political identities, and political communities. So I, as a black woman, I could say, you know, I'm, go, I'm going to, you know, ally myself um, with, with, you know, white women because gender, or I could say, you know, um, <clears throat> I'm oppressed, uh, you know, the Mexican women are oppressed, I'm oppressed, I'm going to go with them, you know? So every time I share a, a, a span of oppression with another group, that's the possibility of a build being, of a, a bridge being built here. So of course, you know, it really, um, this is very, you know, very, very nice, very optimistic that we could do this, maybe, although I don't find it appealing personally. Uh, but there's a reality, and this is the perspective and what it takes, right, to continue to destroy our lives, whether in the diaspora or in Africa. You see, George Floyd was not, was not Chinese. George Floyd was not Japanese. George Floyd was not Mexican. Don't play was black as an African man. And as an African woman, I have to take notice of that. And in fact, you see, those women who call themselves black feminists really have found themselves in a, in a greater uh, and tighter, in a tighter spot. And the final outcome, you know, if you follow intersectionality and black feminism to the end, then you will find yourself in a situation of dilution and integration. Um, and I'm, I'm using here uh, Jennifer Nash's book, uh, book that came out not too long ago on black feminism, and in which she clearly states that it has become commonplace for black feminists to proclaim the death of black feminism itself, to announce that the field's future is in peril because its visionary work has been stymied. So 
they themselves experience this this malaise, this difficulty, because placing black in front of feminism and embarking on the train of postmodernism, which was never an African paradigm, an African theory to begin with, has placed them in a very difficult situation. Now, when it comes to African feminism, I am pleased to say that our sisters on the continent were much more cautious. And in fact, that African women um, who are concerned, who have written about gender issues in Africa, uh, refuse to be called feminist altogether. And I'm citing uh, uh, a sister here, Leslie Ogundipe, who, who was saddened by this situation. She said many of the African female writers like to declare that they are not feminists, as if it were a crime to be a feminist. These denials come from unlikely writers such as Bessie Head, Buchi Emichita, even Maya Mamba. They, the sisters in Africa, became much more uh, much more keenly aware of, of what comes with feminism, and they were not willing to take that on, right? And Gwendolyn Mittal, who edited a book on African feminism in 1997, uh, explains that African feminism differs radically from the Western forms of feminism with which we have become familiar since the 1960s. So if it differs radically, is it still feminism? Right? She said it's different because European feminism was a bourgeois individualist take, you know, struggle. Uh, whereas for us African feminists, you know, in fact, it was women, African women resisting European domination and influences of African culture. And then she said, and that's very important, and I touched upon this before, that whereas European feminists, you know, are interested in or focused on controlling the reproduction um, and, and really reject appropriation as a form of servitude, uh, you know, into exploring their sexuality and new sexual orientation forms and so on and so forth. So this is not what it is for us African feminists at all. In fact, we, we, we're very attached to natality, we're very attached to motherhood, we are very touched with our sexuality because we like, we love African men. We need African men so that we can have babies and life can continue. And our preoccupation is really with keeping our communities together because we are subjected to imperialism and we cannot afford to be, to have white women's preoccupations. And plus our culture, right, will not even allow us to engage in, in, in you know, all those those, those debates that white feminists are engaged in. And, and in addition, you see, they've also have been greatly annoyed, I'm talking about the African film, greatly annoyed with, with you know, certain those white women coming in and, and being very condescending um, and contemptuous. And I'm citing here this white feminist, a historian, uh, Corkery Vidrovich, a French woman, who says, this actually talks about African women, that socially and politically African women now are starting to find their way. You see, they are starting to find the way. Recent changes have sometimes taken place at lightning speed. Today's women are vigorous, creative, and full of promise. And she continues that African women are just becoming aware of what is at stake for them, of their struggles and constraints. So this is this white woman, you would think that, you know, thanks to white feminism, then African women are finally waking up, finally thinking, oh my God, I've been oppressed all these years by those terrible black men, and finally, you know, I'm, I'm coming to terms with the fact that I must do something about it. You know, of course, you know, this is all, you know, wishful thinking, delusion on the part of white women. You know, they can help themselves by always giving lessons to us, even though we have always been in a better situation than they, first, than they have. First of all, is matriarchy. And, you know, I talked about patriarchy in the beginning. Matriarchy in Africa is very, very, very common, you know, and Nesha Kata just explained that quite well. And when we look at matriarchy, it has some characteristics, just like patriarchy has the characteristics of oppressing, suppressing, disenfranchising women politically, spiritually. 
economically, we see that it's the opposite when, when you have a matriarchal society where we have respect and veneration of women, especially as mother. Uh, you see also that women play an important role, right? We have had African queens, provides queen mothers, empresses in Africa. There's been no shortage of that throughout Africa. Uh, and also women have uh, played an important spiritual role, um, you know, reaching really the highest levels of initiation and responsibility to this day. Um, I, I like to quote, uh, to cite this, this fellow, a white guy, as a matter of fact, um, he says that a woman in Egypt could be head of state, religious leader, businesswoman, medical chief. She could bequeath her property to whomever she wanted. She could marry the man of her choice. She had access to means of contraception. And then Pharaoh, it is the couple, the king and the great royal leaf, wife, who is not a first lady dealing simply with, only with charity, far from it. The queen was at the head of diplomacy, spoke several languages, and the girls were as educated as the boys. Can you imagine if you contrast that with what was on Europe at the same time? Clearly, white women are in no position to give African women any lecture about anything. And in later, likewise, later in other parts of Africa, and I'm citing as Catherine Sheldon in her book on African women, she says that women's contributions as spiritual healers, mediums, and leaders were most often related to fertility and reproduction and with the intricate interconnection between marriage, family, children, and agricultural production, it was evident that women were at the center of local politics and economics, and they were not relegated to marginal positions outside of public activity. Their religious responsibilities were central to family health and the continuation of their communities. So again, we see, you know, uh, what is affirmed and asserted here is that women were very much and are very much a central part of the community in Africa. Uh, when we look at the religious sphere, the spiritual sphere, the supreme divinity, we realize it's often female or androgynous, I mean both, or beyond gender. So no gender is assigned. But often the supreme divinity is a woman. And Africans have had no problems with that at all. And I want to give you a quick example of the, the Shona people. Um, and the Shona people have spirits at the family, clan, and um, nation level. And those spirits uh, communicate with the living via mediums. Mwari is the supreme divinity. Interestingly enough, whereas the family medium could be a man or a woman. Where at the clan level, the medium could be a man or a woman. At the highest level, the supreme divinity could only have a female medium. Again, I'm just mentioning this to show the highest esteem in which you know African women were held and are still held. Right. So, but African women now who um, come to feminism. It's difficult for them, right? It's difficult for them to accept the theory because they, they cannot relate to this. They cannot relate to it. This, this notion of, of women being suppressed, oppressed socially, economically. It's not even really that, right? And so they have had to really stretch and twist feminism quite a bit. And I'm, I'm citing Nicole again, she says that although indebted to the global feminist movement, African feminist discourse takes care to delineate those concerns that are peculiar to the African situation. It also questions features of traditional African cultures without denigrating them. There's something that white women love to do. Understanding that these traditional features might be viewed differently by the various classes of women. And some of those African feminists uh, feeling that what they were engaging in was so different, or thinking that it was so different, suggested a different name altogether. They say, why don't we talk about, instead of African feminism, why don't we talk about Stiwanism? And that stands for the social transformation, including women in Africa. 
and they would emphasize not conflict between African men and women, not the right of women, you know, to be X, Y, Z at the expense of their community, but really seeking, you know, parity, a greater parity between men and women on a social level. Another theory that was proposed, and which I want to talk about a little bit, and this will end my presentation on black feminism and African women and African feminism is African womanism. Uh, for me, that's really the greatest alternative um, to black feminism and African feminism. And it was produced in 1987 by our sister scholar, Plano Hudson Wims, uh, to deal with African women's issues from an Afrocentric perspective. And Hertz and Wims felt that really feminism, whether you call it black feminism, African feminism, or womanism, was simply uh, you know, inadequate to deal with our realities um, as African women. She had many, many, many objections to feminism, excuse me. First of all, she brought up the issue of the name and the definition. She said, you know, if we cannot name ourselves and define ourselves, then we really belong to our oppressors because the definition belongs to the definer. And so as long as we use their names, as long as we use their definitions, then we cannot expect to free ourselves mentally. And also, um, being named by others is quite humiliating and, and an abdication of our agency. I and mean, we cannot even do that, come up with our own names you know, we have to use white people, white women say feminism, so we just repeat feminism, we are feminists. They come up with Marxism, so we are, I'm a Marxist too. Can we come up with our own definitions, meaning with our own theories, to truly deliberate ourselves? Another issue that she brings up is that feminism was racist from almost the very beginning. She mentions the fact that white, the white, you know, women who were engaged in the suffragette movement were very upset when the black men got the right to vote with the 15th Amendment. And when the white, the black men got the right to vote before they did, they became really um, very, very, uh, very openly racist. And the third objective is cultural. Uh, she insists, and rightly so, that African women do not see African men as their natural enemies. We are people of life, and we are that for life to continue, the union of a male and a female is necessary. It is imperative. There cannot be life without, you know, men and women sticking together for more of us to come into the world. There's just no alternative to this. I don't care what sexual orientation you embrace, but that is just the hardcore biological reality. And there was also a political issue. She asked the question, can African people really afford to be divided along gender lines? Is it, does it make sense for us African women, right? The sisters, the mothers, the daughters of African men were shot daily on the streets of America to distance ourselves from the plight of our brothers, not realizing that what happens to them has a great implication on us emotionally and on many other different levels. We are faced with the same <coughs> evil of white racism. And this is what Plano Hudson Moore says. She says, if one considers the collective plight of African people globally, it becomes clear that we cannot afford the luxury of being consumed by gender issues. An African theory is an Afrocentric theory, and I will I will end with this quote by Plano Hudson Wins describing African womanism herself. And she said African womanism is neither an outgrowth nor an addendum to feminism. African womanism is not black feminism, African feminism, or workers' womanism that some African women have come to embrace. African womanism is an ideology created and designed for all women of African descent. 
It is grounded in African culture, and therefore, it necessarily focuses on the unique experiences, struggles, needs, and desires of African women. It is grounded in African culture, and therefore, it necessarily focuses on the unique experiences, struggles, needs, and desires of African women. So I will end here by urging us, especially my sisters, let us be ourselves again. Let us name ourselves again. And let us, let us not be so quick to jump on the train of Western decadence. Okay. Okay. Um, there you, uh, you, you have it. Um, uh, I, I wish that I could, um, I'm sorry. Can, can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. Can we hear you? Okay. Sir. I, I, I am not able to, um, uh, I see Phil Coffee there. I'm not able to hear, to, to actually answer any, um, any of the questions, uh, but there may be someone who may want to uh, make a statement or, or to at least make a comment. I mean, we do have about 10 minutes and uh, uh, if you wanna say anything, you can, you can say it and then I'll make the announcements for the next uh, lecture, which will be a coming up. Who? Aku, yeah. Aku, and, yes, please. Yeah, I'm Dr. King too, so when I heard Dr. you talk King, All right, Dr. King, Dr. but I also mentioned Aku. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, I wanted to make a comment because I'm working on a, a grant right now, and one of the uh, questions was to self-identify yourself. And there were 58 different gender identities, 58. And it's really strange because they would ask for self-identity and then they would actually, you, you can see exactly what Dr. Mazama is saying. So we really have uh, an issue with people who are confused. And that yes. was what I wanted to say. All right, thank um, you. I would like to share something. All right. Uh, I definitely enjoyed oh, it, Dr. Who's speaking? Who's speaking? Oh, my, this is Corey Muhammad. Corey Muhammad. How you doing, Corey? I'm doing well. Um, I wanted to say I think that um, this book by Dr. Um, Curry Mannot does an excellent job talking about how feminism's attack not just excluding Black women from it, but its racist history and impact on Black males in particular. And how that feminism and patriarchy from white people's perspective was never talking about males or females, but a race. And I thought that that was very important that black people don't get caught up into these terms using other people's definitions to define us. So I just wanted to share that. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, uh, Dr. Dow. Yes, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Mazama for a really great, helpful PowerPoint and to bring all the issues to the fore and to enable us to understand the complexity of uh, theories that we're dealing with to define who we are. Uh, she makes it very clear. Um, uh, from the perspective of African people challenging um, identities that have been enforced upon us. So I really want, want to say thank you to Dr. Mazama for her clarity in this area. Thank you. Uh, yes, Dr. King. Uh, yes. Dr. Joyce King. It's like <laughs> Dr. Aku King. How are you doing, Aku? Okay. <laughs> Cousin. <laughs> And my other cousin is on the line, uh, Charlotte Parnell. We are actually cousins. <laughs> yeah, that's family good. It's a family thing. And that's right. I would also like to really sincerely extend my thanks to Dr. Mazama again for the clarity uh, and the logical flow of her presentation. The, the, these are very um, 
confusing uh, times that we're in and for someone to courageously step forward and guide us through a way to think about these issues. I really appreciate it. I also want to share, uh, I guess, a, a, a hopefulness of family unity uh, because uh, in my family, we have young people who have chosen to express their gender identity in ways that um, I didn't necessarily choose for myself, but I recognize where they're coming from. And I wanted to share an experience of my growing up, how I experienced these gender issues growing up and encourage us to seek uh, knowledge and understanding. Someone asked me, well, what was going on in Africa before the Europeans arrived? Uh, that's a question. I couldn't answer that question. But this is what I experienced growing up. In my church, I was a Baptist, there was a man who had his hair done every Saturday at the ladies' beauty salon. And he came in, he got his hair done, uh, everybody knew him. And on Sunday at church, there was a particular song that was sung. Everybody who was a member of the church knew that they needed to get up and move out of the way because he was literally gonna tear up the church and knock over the table. <laughs> So if you were a visitor, you didn't know that when that song hit, he was really, they had to carry him out stiff as a board whenever they sang that song. And I, I saw that as a quality of our community that wasn't about tolerance, but it was about embracing a person who saw themselves in a particular way. We all knew him, we all knew he was different, but there was no conversation that I ever heard with the older people that was um, condemning him or making him an outsider of the community. So I just wanted to say that that's what I experienced. I don't know what other people experienced, but that's what I experienced. And it, it's, as, it's real to me as anything else I acknowledge about being black, how the community treated this person who was clearly different. He wore men's clothes, mm -hmm. he, he was a man by appearance, except he got his hair done at the beauty salon with the ladies. And he would fall out when they sang that song. So there was <laughs> obviously more to him than just a category. But I just share that in the hope that we will be ourselves, name ourselves, and value all of ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, can I say yeah. That? Yes, of course. Uh, Brother Kebuma. <laughs> Actually, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Growing up in Africa, I want to agree with uh, Professor Mazama wholeheartedly. We respected our mothers. We respected our women. We had the queens and empresses, as she said. But when I came to the Western world, Prof, my mind was really troubled. Westernization, as she said, have actually defined us. Right now, we have gender neutral bathroom, Prof, in the West. It's not in Africa, but it's getting there. LBGTQ, I grew up in Africa, I didn't know about that. I came to the West, I saw it. It's now getting inching into Africa. So if only the resistance, as Mazama is saying, can actually take hold with our ladies, I'll be extremely ecstatic. Traveling at an airport, a white lady gave me a flyer to fight genital mutilation in Africa. And I sat her down and said, where are you getting this information? Are you saying you should teach us how to fight our problems in Africa? Mm. So the idea that people are defining us, giving us terminologies, we are now all Marxists, as she's talking about, or they talk about all kinds of terminology in the West and we all fall into it. We all take Western names, because if we don't take Western names, we will not know how to pronounce names. 
we are actually confused, bro. We are confused. Yeah. Yeah. I had a student, a Nigerian student, who had to change her name and take a Western name and said, I could not get jobs because of my name. Mm. Really? These are real issues. And I don't know how this movement, all those terminologies we are getting from the West, Mm -hmm. How many of our terminology, like Ubuntu, have been taken by the West? Mm -hmm. What are the African concepts that have been taken by the West? Mm -hmm. So uh, we are consuming at our peril. I just wanted to say that. Thank you, bro. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'd mm -hmm. like to say something. This is Stanley. Stanley, I, Stanley Crawford. Yes, I did. A, I was at a lecture with Dr. Amamazan, which he did on Western decadence. It was one of the most excellent lectures that I've seen to distinguish between what the brother is talking about and what we are experiencing here in this Western decadent society. Also, if you listen to what Amazon was talking about, she says some of this stuff is a luxury. We as kidnapped Africans here on the continent of North America, we can't afford some of this stuff that we are buying into because we need to be able to be united so we can save ourselves. The further we go into this Western decadent concept of paradigm of existence, the further we get away from the ability to save our children and future generations because it's deteriorating. That's my comment. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, uh, at least, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, not, uh, Is Tahia? Yes. Uh, how are you doing, Tahia? Good to see you. Go ahead. Thank you, all of you. Um, one of the things, I did my dissertation and my um, study and PhD at the University of Ghana. And um, one of the things that the women were struggling with at the time in Ghana was to have and they, um, domestic violence legislation and domestic violence protection. And one of the things that Dr. Niara Sadakata and others who studied it came with colonialism came colonialism's way of treating women and bringing that to, to Africa and the way women were disrespected, et cetera. So that had, be, had, had, creeped, had creeped in and has creeped into African culture through colonialism because Europeans never had respect for their women. And Africa work may be different for a man and a woman, but they're both respected and complementary until you bring colonialism in defining and redefining women and who they are and men and who they are. And you have hundreds of years of this oppression of African culture reshaping it for European culture. And so you do have, you have now African women along with men Mm -hmm. redefining and pulling out African relationship to each other. Mm -hmm. But as a result of that, they needed to um, have a domestic violence legislation. Mm -hmm. Violence against women has coming through the history of colonialism. And so there are changes that have been forced upon us that now brings us, um, making us go full circle in recapturing our own relationships and identity with each other as African people. Mm -hmm. Yes, there has to be a distinction between women's issues and calling all of them feminism, however. Oh, there certainly is a distinction and women of Africa know that clearly, clearly well. And the movement in Ghana around human rights as opposed to um, uh, was not about, just, it's not a male-female, it is getting rid of the colonialism and colonial behavior forced upon African culture. Right. Now, oftentimes, it's determined, um, oftentimes they label that though as feminism, even though that's not the terms that those African or Black women may use, sometimes though it's generally put into that category. And I think that it, just like you're doing, it always has to be a distinguishing um, reality made because sometimes like she was saying um, about her students, a lot of times black students will just use that term feminism because they don't know of another term to represent issues that are important to black women. So I think that that distinction has to always be made. Okay. All right. Well, I, I just want my, my final comment on this is that we got to be very uh, cautious and wary of the whole idea of hierarchy because actually uh, which, which probably gets its roots from patriarchy. And that is where you find uh, the oppression. And so mm -hmm. 
we will be looking at that. But I thank all of you for coming uh, to this uh, lecture. And I, I really invite you uh, to uh, the lecture uh, on the 20th uh, with Dr. Uh, Joyce King. Uh, that is our next lecture. Dr. King is uh, actually, uh, uh, it's kind of strange to say this, but uh, she, she holds the same chair that Asa Hilliard held <laughs> at Georgia State. Uh, she is in her own right a major intellectual I first, uh, I met her first in California and then happened to meet her when she was uh, at Spelman acting as the provost. And I remember going to her uh, in her office at Spelman and saying, how in the world did they let you up in here? I could not, I could not understand Joyce King and Spelman at that time. <laughs> and, uh, but she is, um, She's major in the field of education, was the president of the largest educational society in America, research society, and uh, just as a wonderful, fine uh, scholar and uh, a brilliant uh, uh, talk, a lecturer, so, and writer. So we, we will have her uh, speaking at our next one. Thank all of you. Asante. Dr. Asante, where can we yeah. see this presentation again? Uh, uh, this presentation will be uh, will be on YouTube under the MKA lecture series. Thank you. This will be. Uh, give me two days. My my grandson has to put it up. <laughs> yes, okay. sir. All right. It was recorded. Thank you very much. And someone did point out to me. I just saw the chat that we missed a few minutes. We skipped ahead in the lecture. So uh, I, ho I don't. I, I hopefully it will all be there together in one, in one place. All right? Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.